uh, how do we defend why we don't speak in tongues? Uh, so I'll just call that cessationism um, and explain that. Cessationism, I'll have to walk through. Uh, if, if you study the, the gifts, the mother load is 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. Um, there, there are others, uh, you know, 1 Peter 4, um, 1 Thessalonians 5. There are a lot of places that uh, we could talk about spiritual gifts. But I will make, uh, I'll go back to this because we'll need a whole sheet to go on it. The reason I'm personally a cessationist, cessation, like uh, cessation means to cease. I believe that the sign gifts have ceased for this time period. Because the Bible shows that God, uh, if you remember around the time of Moses, the 15th century B.C., there were lots of miracles. We called them plagues. Then around the time of, uh, if I can have there, about the 8th century B.C., around the time of Elijah, there are lots of miracles. Elijah and Elisha, there really are no uh, miracles between the time of Moses and Joshua all the way for uh, you know, 600 years there. And then in the first century, or well, actually in the 6th century B.C. with Daniel, we have some, you know, lion's den and the, the furnace of fire. But again, there is not constant, constant miracles. And then there's a long gap to the first century. And what we see is God does not operate with constant, overt, you know, um, ecstatic, miraculous anything. He, most of redemption history is kind of like normal life. And so in the first century, around the birth of the church, there was an outpouring of miracles. In the time of the Jews in captivity, there's an outpouring of them. When apostasy was hitting the nation of Israel in Elijah and Elisha's time, and at the birth of the nation. But those were punctuated, kind of like the evolutionists talk about punctuated equilibrium. Well, you know, I'm not sure what they mean by that, but I do see that God punctuates history with outbursts of his great miraculous power, but normal life is kind of like Simeon and Anna, no miracles, no ecstatic, whatever. So that's the first reason I'm a cessationist. But from 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, there's another reason. You have to be very cautious if you say God did that, because if God's doing it, then it better be 100% error-free. If you say you're a prophet, like all these people on TV do, the Bible already has said if a prophet says God is prophesying through them, and if even one thing they say doesn't happen, God says kill them. They're a false prophet. So we don't want to kill anybody nowadays. And so almost none of these prophecies, they're so vague, they're so general, even though I deeply admired... Um, the cross and the switchblade guy. I used to always go to his church in New York City with my family when we were on vacation. Uh, Wilkerson is his name. His prophecies were always so vague that they always took place, but they were vague. God doesn't give vague prophecies. He gives precise information that you can bank on. And so I'm not at all saying that these are false prophets. What I'm saying is that the next round of of big miracles is way over here in the tribulation. Joel says that. There's going to be an outpouring of, of spiritual events. And that's when uh, there's going to be the, the dreams and the visions and the, the greatest outpouring of tongue speaking will be when 144,000 can talk to anybody on earth. I mean, most people only, when they speak in languages, no one can understand them. 144,000, everyone's going to understand them. So, but I'll come back to that, especially here. But uh, Calvary Bible Church is a cessationist church. That means we believe that the sign gifts were for the foundational time, the founding of the church, for the writing down of the scriptures, and that God still does miracles, but he does not use miracle workers anymore. And the reason I know this is, I lived in Tulsa for 14 years. That's the mecca of all charismatic work in the world, Tulsa, Oklahoma. What's amazing is they would fill the, the convention center there with 25,000 or more, uh, and, and all the greatest healers, miracle workers, I mean, you name it, they were all there. And yet across the street was a hospital. And there were as many people 
children, burn victims, you know, every blind, lame, cancer. There was many in the hospital before the 25,000 healers, miracle workers, tongue speakers, and prophets. There were, say, a thousand in the hospital when the convention started, and there were still a thousand in the hospital, and not one of them ever walked across the street. And, and that is not, that's anecdotal, but I've never seen a miracle worker that did what the apostles did. Peter's shadow healed people as he walked, and he didn't even charge them, and they didn't have to buy something from the Peter apostolic ministry. So I am concerned because I live there, and I saw so much of it. Now, you say, but I have a dear Assemblies of God friend that speaks in a prayer language. Great. Praise the Lord if the Lord wants them to speak in a prayer language. But don't, don't tell me that they're getting direct revelation from God because God is not still writing the Bible. He said in Revelation, this, don't add to this. So it's not direct revelation. It's, it's some kind of devotional thing. What's interesting, Paul had some kind of a devotional thing, and he says, I speak more than all of you, but I'd rather speak plain English when I'm in front of a group of people so they understand what I'm saying, rather and t than 10,000 words in my prayer language. So we'll come to that. How can I defend from the Bible Calvary's no speaking in tongue stance? I, I would say uh, even, I mean, that is a wonderful question. Uh, if my kids asked me that, I would say what you should say is, how can I come to personal convictions from the Scripture on that issue? Because I'm not sure that all of us are called to go throughout Kalamazoo or anywhere else and defend Calvary's position. It's much stronger for us to say, this is what I believe and uh, from the scriptures. So, uh, so the first question is the, uh, uh, the tongues uh, question. So uh, what we're going to do, and I'm going to need my Bible, this will be very interesting because what, what I think is best is to, to have a, a biblical path that you follow when you talk to someone rather than uh, debating with them, just to say, you, you have a question about that? Would you like to know how I've come to my biblical conviction on that? And so take your Bibles and let's go to Acts chapter 2. And I just want to um, just show you. Uh, if, if someone asked me this and I was sitting with them, um, you know, uh, at, at some restaurant or, or just in my office, this is what I would do. So I'll just think out loud with you. But Acts chapter 2 uh, is is the first time tongues is mentioned in the New Testament, okay? And, and I like to, to examine everything that the Scriptures say on a topic. And so uh, tongues basically is in Acts 2, 10, 19, and in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 to 14. That's, all, that's it. Isn't that Interesting. And it's fascinating if you follow through the book of Acts to see um, that, and, and I thought we'd go faster if I didn't have slides, but it's going to be slower because, uh, but as far as we know, I mean, Peter, when he lists off the spiritual gifts, which he does in 1 Peter chapter 4, he doesn't talk about tongues at all. The Apostle John, who was the final author of Scripture, uh, finished out maybe in 96 AD. Uh, he also, with Peter, discusses nothing about supernatural signs, wonders, speaking in tongues, and miracles. So basically, and, and you can track with me through here, the three occurrences, the historic events, are as the gospel goes to different groupings of people. Um, and, and instead of telling you, I'll show you. So look at, at chapter 2 in verse 1 of the book of Acts. The day of Pentecost, which we've all heard, had fully come. Now remember, Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. Jesus stayed for 40 of those days. Jesus stayed after the resurrection for 40 days, showing himself alive with infallible proofs to his apostles, meeting with them here and there, and culminating with uh, his great commissioning in Galilee, then coming back to Jerusalem and ascending uh, from the Mount of Olives. So that's a thumbnail of 40 days. 
10 days later is right here. So 10 days after chapter 1, the ascension, which is verses 1 through 11 of chapter 1, they go to the upper room and they have this prayer meeting and they have this, this kind of spiritual life conference. And 10 days later, it's right here in verse 1. And it's the day of Pentecost. And you, you see what happens. I mean, just to remind you, verse 4, they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, verse 5, people in Jerusalem hear them as they're speaking. And look what verse 6 says. When this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. What's interesting is tongues in the New Testament was not a private prayer language. It was a supernatural giftedness to speak in a language that you never learned. And you could speak so well that you could communicate to a native speaker. In fact, look at the native speakers. It lists them off in verse 8. How is it that we each hear in our own language? Now, isn't it interesting that tongue means language, but it's, it's language, so it communicates, but it says they speak in tongues, but it's actually the word language, and you all know that. And so each of us here in our own tongue or language in which we were born, and look, there are 15 different languages that the Holy Spirit gave these people supernatural ability to speak in. And, and it lists them off, Parthians, isn't that interesting there first? Those were the mortal enemies of the Romans, the ones that were, that were never conquered. The Parthia was never conquered. But the Parthians were there. They heard the gospel. The Medes, uh, those are the, uh, remember this morning we talked about Marcia going to the Kurds that have migrated to the black soil district of, of Russia, south of Moscow, that, that she said, and Jeff said, that's the Medes. So they're still around from the Bible times. Medes or Kurds. The Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, on and on it goes. Fifteen different understandable languages just in that one meeting. So that's the first time. Now, keep going to um, chapter 10 and uh, the second occurrence. So the first one, it was languages and 15 of them to be exact. In chapter 10 of the book of Acts, by the way, what, what isn't clear is something happens in chapter 8. Uh, this is Jews. In chapter 8, Samaritans. Now, it doesn't say they spoke in tongues, but it says that there were signs and miracles and wonders. And uh, then, but there's no tongues as far as we know here. But in chapter 10... Now we're talking about uh, the Gentiles are getting the gospel. So the gospel goes to the Jews, then it goes to the Samaritans, and now it goes to the Gentiles, a little G right there. And it's Cornelius, and, and we know the story. Peter's up uh, praying on the rooftop in Simon the Tanner's house in modern day, still there. The place is still there in Joppa. And he sees the sheet and all that, and, and he he starts, look in verse 12 of chapter 10, all kinds of four-footed animals on the earth, and, and he's praying, and a voice says to him, verse 15, uh, what God has cleansed, and then the, the Gentiles come, and look what happens when Peter thought about the vision in verse 19, the Spirit said to him, three men are seeking you, and doubt nothing, verse 20, I've sent them, so Peter goes, verse 24, to Caesarea, he recounts, you know, the, the whole event, then in verse 34, Peter opens his mouth and he starts preaching. And look at verse, that was 34. Now look at 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. And those, now this is really significant, of the circumcision, what's that? That's, that's code for Jews. Those of the cir circumcision, those either proselytes to Judaism or natural-born descendants of Abraham, those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Now this is tongues one, Jews. Tongues two, Jews seeing Gentiles get saved. And the, the evidence that the gospel had come to them was 
verse 46, they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered and said, can anybody forbid him to be baptized? So, tongues number one, Acts two, Jews uh, from 15 different nations. Tongues number two, these Gentiles. Now keep going to chapter 19, and we have a third group. And basically, what we have is Paul, starting in, in chapter 19, verse 1, is at Ephesus, and he passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, he found some disciples, verse 2. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to them, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit, which is code for no, you know. Uh, they didn't. And he said to them, into what were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. So what are these? Well, we, we call them Old Testament type of believers. I mean, th I, they were good people. They believed the Bible. They believed all the, the Old Testament. They just had never heard about Christ and the cross and his death, his burial, his resurrection. So they had never been born again. They were just Old Testament saints and were baptized into John the Baptist's baptism. And it was a baptism of repentance, verse 4 says, saying to the people that they should believe in him who would come after him, that is on Jesus Christ. And when they heard this, look at verse 5, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid hands on them, look at this, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now these, these were Old Testament saints in pagan lands. They were not running to uh, Jerusalem. They were living in the Ephesus region. And now we have the third instance of tongues. That's fascinating. You know, for all the, the talk of this around our world and the divisions that it causes, you would think that out of the 260 chapters of the New Testament, the tongue speaking would fill them because that seems to be what fills more than half of Christendom. It actually is only in three very small parts of three chapters and then it's regulated because of misuse, misunderstanding, pride, etc., etc., in Corinth, and it's nowhere else. Isn't that fascinating? So at the most, three chapters in the book of Acts and three in Corinth. So tongue speaking is not in 254 chapters of the New Testament you would think it permeated every bit from all the, the conflict, but that, that there isn't Christendom. Now, in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, uh, we, let me show you one other thing, and then we'll go to 1 Corinthians 14, because I want to show you something fascinating that maybe you've never thought of. Go to Acts 28, and I want to show you what is probably the very last miracle in the New Testament, the very last miraculous sign miracle in the New Testament. So we have in the book of Acts, we have Christ uh, ascending, you know, saying goodbye to the disciples. We have the day of Pentecost and a tongues occurrence. Uh, we have the tremendous ingathering uh, and preaching and persecution and all that's going on in the establishment of deacons and, you know, Stephen's sermon and then getting stoned and then Paul doing all of his, uh, in chapter 8, being like, uh, you know, uh, wild animal digging up the church and then Paul gets converted and then we have the second tongues speaking. After the Jews, then we get the Gentiles. And then the book of Acts goes on and we have uh, Paul's missionary journeys and they just keep going here and he uh, you know, gets stoned in 14, comes back for the Jerusalem council, goes back out for another to Philippi and to Ephes or I mean to uh, Thessalonica, to Corinth, and then he gets to Ephesus in Acts 19. And after, now remember, he was, he was preaching in Corinth right here in chapter 18. He leaves Corinth after a year and a half. He's 18 months there. And he goes to Ephesus for 36 months, three years. In chapter 20, while Paul is in chapter 20, I shouldn't circle it because it's not a tongue speaking. Don't want you to get mixed up. Um, let me just get rid of that. But in chapter 20, 
Paul writes back to Corinth. And he writes back to Corinth sometime, you know, 56 maybe, A.D. Maybe 55, you know, it doesn't really matter right now. Chapter 20, he writes back the epistle to the Corinthians. Then Paul continues in all of his ministry, gets captured, shipwrecked, and now look at chapter 28. I want to show you what what is fascinating. And verse 8, And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick with a fever and dysentery, and Paul went into him, prayed, and laid his hands on him, and healed him. Now this is right after the snake out of the fire sticks bit Paul, and that's in verse 5 where Paul shakes the viper off and everybody thinks he was a murderer, he escaped from the sea and he's going to die on the spot. And he shook the snake off in the fire and didn't die. And everyone went, ooh, this guy, they thought he was a god. Then he walks up to the, the chief of the island's father's bedside, lays his hands on him and healed him. Verse 8 of chapter 28, as far as we know, That's the final miraculous sign and wonder in the New Testament. Have you ever thought of that? When was that? That was about A.D. 58. Remember he wrote to the Corinthians with all the the hoopla about tongue speaking. The last sign miraculous event. How do we know that? Because Paul's writing letters to Timothy saying, take a little medicine. Why didn't he just heal him? He left, he left people behind. He says, I have left my fellow worker Epaphroditus behind because he's sick. Why didn't Paul heal him? Have you ever thought of that? that it was not normative what we see in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where people can heal anything at any time. They, I mean on TV at least. When the cameras are going, they can heal anything. Paul, it appears, in sync with the Spirit of God, stopped. God stopped supernatural miracle workers. Now, I mean, Paul's shadow. There's my shadow going across the piano. His shadow going across people laid on the ground. Peter's shadow going across people laid on the ground. Handkerchiefs coming from their workshop where they wiped the sweat off their brow. Anything like that healed miraculously anybody it touched. But all that stopped right here. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about the fact that as long as we're talking about this is uh, uh, what I would call the scope of church history, what's interesting is that in all of church history, uh, two men, the, the greatest church historians and theologians, Uh, historical theologist, I would say. Chrysostom, who was the great theologian of the Eastern Church, Constantinople. Augustine, you've heard of him, the Western Church, uh, Hippo, Northern Africa. Both men said that tongue speaking ceased in the apostolic times. They were living back just three centuries after the birth of the church and after the miraculous apostolic times. And what they said is that these men said that the outbreak um, of the uh, Montanists, who were the tongue speakers of the early um, third century, it says that the Montanists who spoke in tongues were heretics. Isn't that interesting? That the heretics, well, who cares? Oh, come on. There we go. Aren't you glad for an eraser? Uh, we're heretics. They said these people, that, that tongue speaking, the, the greatest theologians of the early church, Augustine and Chrysostom. Chrysostom was an evangelistic local church pastor in Constantinople, in the Roman Empire. They said that these people who believed that their speaking in tongues was continuing revelation and they were adding to the Bible, they said they were heretics. And basically, in all of church history, we don't find tongue speaking other than these Montanists declared heretics. And 
After that, uh, there's Mother Anna Lee. You've heard of her, right? She's the one that started the Shakers. The Shakers, they spoke in tongues in the 17th century. We don't have tongue speaking in the church. Mother Anna Lee comes along and she says, I'm a female Jesus Christ. And she spoke in tongues to prove it. I would say she wasn't, right? And, and you would too. Then there's this fellow called Irving that comes along and he speaks in tongues. He's a Presbyterian, so that's thankfully safer than a female Jesus Christ shaker. And Irving's, none of his prophecies came true. And so to outdo him, the Jansons, and that was uh, the Janisons, uh, they were a Roman Catholic group that were trying to overcome uh, the growth of evangelicalism. They began to speak in tongues, but they never claimed salvation. And really, there, there's really no strain of born-again believers speaking in tongues until we come to the modern times and the advent of kind of the, what you've all read about. So that, that's the first reason. So if, if I was, uh, I should have said this. Number one, the first reason why I have a biblical conviction for what I shared last time, which is called cessationism. Now, cessationism comes from uh, 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 8, and I'll end with that. Cessation, as for tongues, they shall cease. That's the doctrine of cessationism. But the first reason that I personally am a cessationist is because tongues were very targeted to Jews, to Gentiles with Jewish witnesses, and to people that were followers of a Jewish evangelist, John the Baptist, who had never heard about Christ. Now, that's the first reason. The second reason is uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14. And let's go there. Um, look at what it says. Well, in fact, let's just go so I don't spend all night on this to 1 Corinthians 14. And I want to show you something that the Bible says. And by the way, from uh, A.D. 58 until the canon closed in 96 when the Apostle John finished Revelation, the Apostle John finished writing Inspired Scripture. Inspired Scripture closed. The canon. The, the, the recognized inspired books closed in about 96 A.D. Did you know that between here and here, there are zero recorded biblical accounts of signs, wonders, and tongue speaking in the early church? That, that is fascinating. But let's go back to 1 Corinthians 14 because the second reason that I would share I have a conviction of cessationism is because of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And look what, look what by the way, the whole chapter... 12 is all about spiritual gifts. Tongues is a part of the list. Chapter 13 we'll come back to, which has the cessationism in it. And chapter 14 begins to, remember Paul is correcting a problem in Corinth. And Paul says, pursue love, verse 1, and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And, and prophecy has two meanings. Don't be confused that he's telling everybody to tell the future. Future telling was what prophets did. Prophesying is to speak forth the word of God, uh, to declare. Boy, that's unclear, but at least there's marks on the board. Prophecy means to declare, to speak out. He says, it's better for you to prophesy. Why? Verse 2, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, and no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mystery, but he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I would that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you prophesied. Isn't that interesting? Paul was saying, Yes, the Holy Spirit is prompting people to speak in tongues and they are being translated and they are being ministering to the church, but, but why don't all of you, since not all of you speak in tongues, I wish all of you did, but all of you don't. Did you catch that? I would. I wish you all spoke in tongues. Chapter 14, verse 5. Does that, isn't that interesting? They didn't all. 
They were all saved and they didn't all speak in tongues. There's a whole segment of Christianity that thinks if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. You understand? They didn't even do that in the first century. It was only certain people who spoke in tongues. And they were supposed to, as chapter 14 says, um, follow some rules. And, and you notice what the rules are in, in verse 27 of the same chapter. This is, this is how, if the Holy Spirit is, is prompting tongue speaking, in, in verse 26, it will be done for edification. And here are the rules. Verse 27, if anyone speaks in a tongue, there will be two or at the most three in turn and let one interpret. So tongue speaking was, was one by one. You, one person spoke. It was interpreted. So everyone got edified because no one could understand them speaking in this foreign language that none of them spoke. And then another one spoke, and they were interpreted. And then the last one, because one, two, at the most three. Isn't that interesting? That was the order of the early church. That's not what goes on today at all, hardly, anywhere. And verse 32, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, and on and on it goes. But now let's get to 1 Corinthians 14. Look at verses 21 and 22, because this is the second reason that, that I believe the Bible teaches cessationism, and it's in verse, uh, starting in verse 20. Brethren, don't be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. Boy, that's a very important verse. Don't be experts in evil. Don't know about all the filth in the world, in, in all of the, the bad stuff, in, in malice and evil. Don't be experts. But in understanding the things of God, be as grown up as you can get. And then it says this. This is fascinating. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me. Now, just for a second, turn back to chapter 1 and verse 22 of the same book. 1 Corinthians 1, 22. And, and look what it says. For Jews request a sign, Greeks seek after wisdom. So Paul has already set the stage for what he's talking about in 14. I just wanted to draw your attention to 122. Paul has already said that Jewish people, Jews, want signs. Why do they want signs? Because Abraham... God made a promise to Abraham, and Abraham became the father through whom the Jewish nation came, through whom Christ came. All of the scriptures, all of the scriptures came somehow attached through Abraham and the Jewish people. All of the scriptures, and so did the Savior. So Jewish people think they had a corner on everything. They think that they were the super right with God people. And so they need a sign. Now look back at chapter 14, verse 21. And the law is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people. Yet for all that they will not hear me, says the Lord. Now look at verse 22. This is probably one of the most important verses about charismatic utterances. But only if you read it in context. Because they just talked about, verse 21, um, a, a quotation from the Old Testament. Actually, it's from Isaiah 28, that little um, quotation there, that, that God was going to speak to the Jews who required a sign because they didn't believe. Because what do you have to believe for? You've got the Messiah and the Scriptures and the Covenant and you've got everything. The oracles of God came through the Jews. So look what it says in 22. Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. Oh. Now, what you could take that is two ways. You could take it that tongues are an evangelistic tool, and so if you want to win people to the Lord... Speak in tongues, and they will get saved. That's, that's one way. The other way, and, and 
I would believe that this is incorrect because in a moment Paul says it. He says, if an unbeliever comes into your church in Corinth and hears you speaking in tongues, they'll think you're crazy. He actually says that a little bit later. So we know this view is not correct. The other one is that it was a sign for unbelieving Jews that tongues were a sign to the people who had Abraham, the birth of the Jewish nation, the scriptures came through them, and the Messiah came through them. And those people, having all that, still didn't believe. Now, do you see why tongues show up when Jews get saved, when Gentiles get saved, and Jews witness that event and still couldn't believe it, and when Paul talks about it in chapter 11, people didn't believe it until the other witnesses that came, I mean, when Peter talked about it, no one believed it until the other Jews that witnessed it said, no, they spoke in tongues just like us. It really happened. They really, Gentiles really got saved. And the same thing right here. The only three times tongues occur in the book of Acts is only as a sign to Israel that Jews can be saved, that Gentiles can be saved, and that even these people that are Gentile adherents to the gospel that was preached in advance by John the Baptist could be saved too if they believed in Christ. So back to uh, this important passage, 1422. Tongues are for a sign, not for those who believe, but for unbelievers. But prophecy is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Now look at verse 23. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not think you're out of your mind? That's why it can't mean that tongue speaking is evangelistic. It was for a sign to the Jews. That's what verses 21 and 22 say. So, what's interesting is that it appears that there was this spectacular time of miracles from the beginning of Christ's ministry through A.D. about 58. So, about just under 30 years of signs, which included tongues, wonders, uh, shadows, handkerchiefs, you know, raising the dead, uh, all kinds of miraculous workers. I mean, Jesus sent out the 12, he sent out the 70, uh, the early disciples, we just have all of this amazing signs and wonders going on for about 28 years. And there are still apostles, as in Peter, but we don't hear any miracles or tongue speaking. John, who goes all the way to 96, and the New Testament is closed, no signs, wonders, miracles, tongues. Paul is not even able to heal people after this, that we know of. Now you say, Argument from silence is weakest. It's not an argument from silence. He says, I left. Poor Epaphrodite was sick nigh unto death. I left Trophimus. Uh, Timothy, take, take a little wine for your stomach and all of your sicknesses. And so it appears that, that right here, God says, it's interesting what happens in AD 58. If you read Acts 28, all the leaders of Judaism outside of Israel in Rome came to Paul's house and Paul reasoned from morning to night with them and they said we're not interested only a few believed and what the Lord said is the sign to the Jews is done we have shown them for 28 years or 30 years and it's it so and now the last one and and oh here my great goal Zach, it's going to be a long title next week, too, So, because we have three more questions. But these are big questions. But look at 1 Corinthians 13, 8. And here's the last uh, reason. The, the first reason why 
I'm a cessationist is because it was a sign to Israel. The second reason why I'm a cessationist is because there is no continuance of this, even in the New Testament era from 58 on, and all throughout church history. But here's the third reason, and uh, it would be 1 Corinthians 13, 8. And just carefully read this with me because it's, it's, it's beautiful. What it says, love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. What's interesting is that um, the first two uh, prophecies, I mean the first one, prophecy, and the last one. So there's, there, there's an order here. There's prophecies, and then tongues is in the middle, and then there's uh, knowledge. Knowledge. Now, what's interesting is this is a different word. This word that, that says, as for tongues, they will cease. That's the cessation. And what it means, if you look that word up, that it will stop. It will just stop. End. It will end. These two, it will end and not start again, actually. There's no reason to have a sign to Israel anymore because the Lord, by the way, after A.D. 58, after that closing, it was just a decade later that the Romans came and knocked down the whole place. They knocked down the temple. They knocked down Jerusalem. They just kind of cleared the deck on, on Judaism with all of its sacrifices. And the Jews have not sacrificed since. Have you thought about that? They haven't had an altar. They can't. I mean, they every so often start a riot threatening to nowadays, but they don't. These two, the word prophecies, it says prophecies, they will fail. What it means is they'll slowly fade out. They'll slowly fade out a need for this. And it did. Um, the, the prophecies in the sense of foretelling the future, the prophets ended with the establishment of the canon, of the scriptures. And knowledge, you notice what it says here, uh, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away. That's verses 9 and 10. And so basically, depending on, on what you say, the, if the prophecies is taken as the speaking the word of God, that will fade out, of course, by the time we get to heaven. And if knowledge is the Lord illumining his word, that will also fade out by the time we get to heaven. These fade out. They slowly go away, the prophecy and knowledge, but the tongues cease. That's what the Bible says. The only question that modern-day charismatics have is, is that verse talking about something in the future, or has it already happened? And that's the only question there is, because this is clear as day that tongues will cease. And, and that, and you can read, there's a lot of literature on it. And by the way, most charismatic scholars know and love the Lord and follow him with all their heart. And so I'm not at all intoning on saying that there's anything evil or wicked. I see a lot of passion and fervor. By the way, I went to Hazel High School in the 70s, and that was at the height of the charismatic movement. And, and everybody in our Bible study was all sitting with their little sheet trying to learn how to speak in tongues. And we, they passed them out. The Bible study passed them out. I got one. I took it home, worked for a whole week on it. And, and, and if any of you were alive in the 70s, you know that when the whole charismatic movement started, it just was such a, a very exciting time. But no one stepped back to look at the fact of what was going on for all these centuries uh, when, when especially uh, Augustine, come on, um, that, that from the early church, all the way through, from 58 through the time of Augustine and Chrysostom, there was no tongue speaking. One group comes up, the Montanists, but they had so much heresy, they, they canceled them, and it doesn't show up again until the Shakers in America and on through in the modern times. And so all that to say, that's why I would have a biblical conviction called cessationism.